25 Ways to Win with People. How to Make Others Feel Like a Million Bucks. Written by John C. Maxwell and Les Parrott. And copyrighted by John C. Maxwell. This abridged audiobook was published by Nelson Business, a division of Thomas Nelson Publishers, Nashville, Tennessee. John Maxwell, known as America's expert on leadership, speaks in person to hundreds of thousands of people each year. He has communicated his leadership principles to Fortune 500 companies, the United States Military Academy at West Point, and sports organizations such as the NCAA, the NBA, and the NFL. Maxwell is the author of over 30 books, including The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership and Developing the Leader Within You, both of which have sold more than one million copies. Les Parrott is a professor of clinical psychology at Seattle Pacific University. He has written several books with his wife Leslie, including Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts and Becoming Soulmates. Chapter 1. Start With Yourself if you want to win with people, you've got to be a winner yourself, or at the very least be on your way to becoming one. There's no avoiding this simple fact. Let me say it straight. If you try to practice the ways of winning with people that you are about to learn in the following chapters, before you give serious attention to how you could become a winner yourself, you'll be sorely disappointed. However, if you will first take the time to focus on yourself, you'll soon be ready to focus on others. 1. You can't be happy without being healthy. Psychology used to think it was critical to focus on and then eliminate negative emotions. We now know there is a better way. A new generation of research has shifted psychology's primary analysis from that of misery to an understanding of wellness. The new research reveals that you can't be happy simply by being unencumbered by depression, stress, or anxiety. No, you can't be happy unless you are healthy. And there's a lot more to health than not being sick. Emotional health is more than the absence of dysfunctional emotions. Emotional health is at the center of winning with people. Secondly, you can't give what you don't have. Like every other psychologist in training, when I first began my graduate education, I was urged to get into psychotherapy myself. Less, my advisor said, as a psychologist, you will only be able to take a person as far as you have gone yourself. Why? Because you cannot give what you do not have. You cannot enjoy others until you enjoy yourself. The bottom line, if you are not becoming a winner, you will find it almost impossible to win with others. But here's the good news. Your desire and attempts to win with others help to make you a winner. Everyone has little anxieties and insecurities. If I were to ask you to describe a winning person, a person who is whole and healthy, you might say something about this person being confident, warm, kind, stable, giving, and so on. And you'd be right, in a sense. But there's more to becoming a winner than having a list of enviable attributes. Being a winner comes down to one thing, your value. Winners are valuable. Ask any star athlete or gold medalist who has just signed a multi-million dollar endorsement deal. But truth be told, being a winner in the purest sense of the word has nothing to do with your performance, your salary, or your earning potential. It has to do with your value and whether or not you have owned it. When you embrace your own personal value, when you are secure in who you are, then you have become a winner. Here are just a few ways of doing that. Recognize your value. I was on a speaking platform with my friend Gary Smalley when he did something that captivated the crowd. Before an audience of nearly 10,000 people, Gary held out a crisp $50 bill and asked them, who would like this $50 bill? Hands started going up everywhere. I'm going to give this $50 to one of you, he said, but first let me do this. He proceeded to crumple up the bill. Then he asked, who still wants it? The same hands went up in the air. Well, he continued, what if I do this? He dropped it on the ground and started to grind it into the floor with his shoe. He picked it up, all crumpled and dirty. Now, who still wants it? Again, hands went into the air. You have all learned a valuable lesson, Gary said. No matter what I do to the money, you still want it because it doesn't decrease in value. It is still worth $50. 
Gary's simple illustration underscores a profound point. Many times in our lives, we are dropped, crumpled, and ground into the dirt by the decisions we make or the circumstances that come our way. We may feel as though we are worthless, insignificant in our own eyes and in the eyes of others. But no matter what has happened or what will happen, we never lose our value as human beings. Nothing can take that away. Never forget that. Accept your value. How many times have you heard people say, he has issues? What they mean is that the person is stuck. The person is not healthy. He's got a hang-up. He's uncomfortable in his own skin. It's what we psychologists are getting at when we talk about self-acceptance. Let's face it. All of us walking around on this planet have insecurities and issues that we wish we could change about ourselves. But certain things we can't. Some things about us just are. Maybe you weren't born with the kind of looks you would like, or you aren't as tall as you desire. Your genes dealt you a hand that you've eventually got to accept. Either that, or you reject your personal value and spend your days trying to compensate for your insecurities. You become hung up, stuck on not being dealt a better hand. Increase your value. Perhaps you already recognize and accept your value. Maybe you know at the center of your being, deep in your soul, that you are loved by God and are of inestimable value. Congratulations! The next step is to increase your value to others by solving as many of your problems as you can. In other words, you need to maximize who you are by overcoming or fixing those things that are within your power to change. You may struggle with a hair-trigger temper, for example. Maybe you have difficulty setting boundaries or taking responsibility. Maybe you have some bad habits, or perhaps your attitude needs an overhaul. All of us have hurdles we can overcome. Forty-five percent of Americans report that they would change a bad habit if they could. The truth is, they can change. Each of us can improve ourselves whenever we decide to. Believe in your value. Once you've recognized your value, accepted it, and increased it, you've eventually got to believe it. You've got to believe it with such conviction that you'd be willing to bank on it. Chuck Wepner never learned this lesson. As a boxer, he earned the nickname the Bayonne Bleeder because of the punishment he took even while winning. In the boxing world, he was what's called a catcher, a fighter who often uses his head to block the other guy's punches. Wepner continually pressured his opponent until he either won or got knocked out. He never cared how many shots he had to absorb before landing a knockout blow. Trainer Al Braverman called him the gutsiest fighter I ever met. He was in a league of his own. He didn't care about pain. If he got cut or elbowed, he never looked at me or the referee for help. He was a fighter in the purest sense of the word. When Wepner knocked out Terry Henke in the 11th round in Salt Lake City, boxing promoter Don King offered Wepner a title shot against then-heavyweight champion George Foreman. But when Ali defeated Foreman, Wepner found himself scheduled to fight the greatest, Muhammad Ali. On the morning of the fight, Wepner gave his wife a pink negligee and told her she would soon be sleeping with the heavyweight champion of the world. Ali scored a technical knockout with just 19 seconds remaining in the fight. But there was a moment, one glorious moment in the ninth round, when a ham-like paw to Ali's chest knocked the reigning champion off his feet. Wepner recalled, When Ali was down, I remember saying to my ringman, Al Braverman, Start the car. We're going to the bank. We're millionaires. And Al said to me, You'd better turn around because he's getting up. After the fight, Wepner's wife pulled the negligee out of her purse and asked, Do I go to Ali's room, or does he come to mine? That story would be nothing more than an odd boxing footnote, except for one thing. A struggling writer was watching the fight, and then it suddenly struck him. There it is, he said to himself. So I went home and I started writing, and I wrote for three days straight. That's how writer and actor Sylvester Stallone described the birth of the Academy Award-winning movie Rocky to James Lipton on Inside the Actor's Studio. The movie studio offered the struggling writer an unprecedented $400,000 for his script, but Stallone refused the money, choosing instead just $20,000 
and the right to play the part of Rocky for actor's minimum wage, a paltry $340 a week. The studio also made an offer to Wepner since the movie was based on his life. He could receive a flat fee of $70,000 or 1% of the movie's gross profits. Wanting the guaranteed payday, Wepner took the $70,000, a decision that ultimately cost him $8 million. Today, Chuck Wepner lives in Bayonne and works as a liquor salesman. The same thing happens whenever you sell yourself short. If you don't believe that you have something of great value to offer another person, namely yourself, you'll never truly win with people. Who you are is the greatest asset you'll ever possess. And as long as you recognize this valuable asset, accept it, increase it, and believe it with deep conviction, the ways of winning with people in this book can become a part of your character. And when they come from the heart, they work like a charm. Each of the chapters in this book closes with a piece to help you apply what you've learned. It's designed to help you put the chapter's winning way into action. To apply this lesson from chapter 1 to your own life, forget about whatever makes you feel insecure. Ask, how can I increase my value to benefit myself for others? Do it. List the things you can improve about yourself, bad habits to break, etc., along with specific steps to take to make the improvements. Remember, your relationships can only be as healthy as you are. Chapter 2. Practice the 30-Second Rule One of the most valuable lessons in winning with people that I have ever learned from John is the 30-Second Rule. Within the first 30 seconds of a conversation, say something encouraging to a person. John is a master at it. While I was sitting in a meeting at one of his companies a short time ago, John entered the room and within just a few minutes said something encouraging to each person around the table. David, I heard you hit it out of the park this morning on that conference call. Larry, you're making me look so good with that consultation in Denver. Thank you. Les, I'm so glad you made the trip out here to be with us today. I know you're going to add tremendous value to our discussion. Very early on, John had genuinely encouraged each one of us, and it seemed almost effortless. People everywhere need a good word, an uplifting compliment to fire their hopes and dreams. It takes very little effort to do, but it really lifts people up. John, when most people meet others, they search for ways to make themselves look good. The key to the 30-second rule is reversing this practice. When you make contact with people, Instead of focusing on yourself, search for ways to make them look good. Every day before I meet with people, I pause to think about something encouraging I can tell them. What I say can be one of many things. I might thank them for something they've done for me or for a friend. I might tell others about one of their accomplishments. I might praise them for personal quality they exhibit. Or I might simply compliment their appearances. The practice isn't complicated, but it does take some time, effort, and discipline. The reward for practicing it is huge because it really makes a positive impact on people. Psychologist Henry H. Goddard conducted a study on energy levels in children using an instrument he called the ergograph. His findings are fascinating. He discovered that when tired children were given a word of praise or commendation, the ergograph showed an immediate upward surge of energy in the children. When the children were criticized or discouraged, the ergograph showed that their physical energy took a sudden nosedive. You may have already discovered this intuitively. When someone praises you, doesn't your energy level go up? And when you're criticized, doesn't that comment drag you down? Words have great power. What kind of environment do you think you could create if you continually affirm people when you first came into contact with them? Not only would you encourage them, but you would also become an energy carrier. Whenever you walked into a room, the people would light up. You would help to create the kind of environment everyone loves. Just your presence alone would brighten people's day. The 30-second rule also instills motivation. Vince Lombardi, the famed Green Bay Packers football coach, was a feared disciplinarian, but he was also a great motivator. One day he chewed out a player who had missed several blocking assignments. 
After practice, Lombardi stormed into the locker room and saw that the player was sitting at his locker, head down, dejected. Lombardi mussed his hair, patted him on the shoulder, and said, One of these days you're going to be the best guard in the NFL. That player was Jerry Kramer, and Kramer says he carried that positive image of himself for the rest of his career. Lombardi's encouragement had a tremendous impact on my whole life, Kramer said. He went on to become a member of the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame and a member of the NFL's All-50 Year Team. Everybody needs motivation from time to time. Using the 30-second rule helps encourage people to be and do their best. Never underestimate the power of motivation. One of the great side benefits of the 30-second rule is that it also helps you. You can't help others without also helping yourself. If you want others to feel good about themselves and to feel glad every time they see you, then practice the 30-second rule. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about searching for ways to make yourself look good. Instead, search for ways to make others look good. Ask, what positive, encouraging thing can I say to each person I will see today? Do it. Give everyone you meet the triple A treatment, attention, affirmation, and appreciation. Remember, within the first 30 seconds of a conversation, say something encouraging. Chapter 3. Let people know you need them. Less. One day I asked John the secret to getting people to join a team, and he told me it could be found in a single sentence, I can't do it without you. He went on to say that great leaders stumble when they believe people need them instead of recognizing that the very opposite is true. Leaders can become great, said John, only when they realize that they are the ones who need people. John, the day I realized I could no longer do everything myself was a major step in my development as a person and as a leader. I've always had vision, plenty of ideas, and vast amounts of energy. But when the vision gets bigger than you, You really only have two choices, give up on the vision or get help. I chose the latter. No matter how successful you are, no matter how important or accomplished, you do need people. That's why you need to let them know that you cannot win without them. President Woodrow Wilson said, We should not only use all the brains we have, but all that we can borrow. Why stop with just their brains? And less people's hands and hearts, too. Have you ever stopped to ask someone for directions? You roll down your car window and ask a passerby, Can you tell me how to find Larry's Market? Nearly every time people stop whatever they're doing and help if they can, even if it means crossing the street or standing in traffic. They may even repeat the directions a couple of times to make sure you get it. Why? Because whenever a person feels that he or she knows something you don't, it gives that person an ego boost. Everyone likes to be an expert, even if it's just for a moment. It gives them a great sense of superiority and of accomplishment when they help. That translates into an increased sense of self-worth, and it all stems from the universal need to be needed. People need to know they need people. It marks a big step in your development when you come to realize that other people can help you do a better job than you could do alone, said steel magnate and philanthropist Andrew Carnegie. Sadly, many people never achieve that level of maturity or insight. Some people still want to believe that they can achieve greatness alone. We all need people, and if we don't know it, we're in trouble. People need to know they are needed. Every human being longs for a life of significance. We all need to know we are needed and that what we offer to others is of value. People need to know that they helped. Whenever someone tells how valuable the people on my team are to them, I encourage them to tell the individuals who were so helpful. Why? Because people need to know that they helped someone. Good leaders make people feel that they're at the very heart of things, not at the periphery, says author and leadership expert Warren Bennis. Everyone feels that he or she makes a difference to the success of the organization. When that happens, people feel centered, and that gives their work meaning. It's not a sign of weakness to let others know you value them. It's a sign of security and strength. When you're honest about your need for help, specific with others about the value they add, 
and inclusive of others as you build a team to do something bigger than you are, everybody wins. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about a prideful attitude that causes you to prove how capable you are without the help of others. Ask, who specifically can help me do a better job than I can do alone? Who is just waiting to be asked to join in what I am doing? Do it. Sincerely ask others for input or help and attend carefully to what they have to say. Remember, individuals who win with people make others feel that they are at the very heart of things, not at the periphery. Chapter 4. Create a Memory and Visit It Often Less. One day when John was scheduled to speak to 3,000 young leaders in Phoenix at an event, as he stepped onto the platform, he realized his host had something different in mind. He didn't want me to speak at all, John explained. The group that was gathered had been reading his books and listening to his tapes through the years and had planned a surprise. Instead of having John speak to them, they wanted to speak to John. So they had him sit on the platform and simply listen as they honored him. One after another, twelve pre-selected leaders from the audience came up to the podium to tell the group about how John's teaching had made an impact on his or her life. It was completely unexpected, John said, and not only did they shower me with kind words, but each speaker presented me with a memento, a tangible remembrance of something they said they had learned from me. I was completely overwhelmed by the experience. One person gave John a beautiful painting with two images, one of a child reading one of John's books, and another of the child as a grown man coaching others. Less, John said, tears in his eyes and his voice cracking, I don't know how many times I've reminisced about that day. I keep the mementos around my office to relive it. That experience meant so much to me, and it renewed my desire to create memories for others. John Few things bond people together like a shared memory. Soldiers who battle together, teammates who win a championship, and work teams that hit their goals and share a connection that never goes away. Married couples who experience rough times can often look back on their earlier experiences together to keep them going. Families bond when they rough it on camping trips or share adventures on vacation and then love recounting their experience years later. Some memories come as the result of circumstance, but many can be proactively created. The richest memories are often those we plan and intentionally create. Here are some hints for creating memories that will help you win with people. 1. Make something happen. Memories don't find us, we find them. Even better, if we are intentional, we can make memories. If you mention the word chariot to friends Dan and Patty Reland or Tim and Pam Elmore, I can tell you exactly what will come to mind. A crisp autumn day in New York City when we did something that still makes us laugh. After lunch at Tavern on the Green, I hired three bicycle chariots with pedaling drivers to take each couple on a race through Manhattan to Macy's. It was up to each couple to motivate their driver to win, using whatever financial incentives they wanted. The race was neck and neck the entire way, and we laughed the whole time. We still laugh when we think about it to look at the photos we took that day, but it never would have happened if we hadn't initiated it. 2. Set aside time to make something happen. For years, parents have debated the issue of quality time versus quantity of time, and as a father and grandfather, I have discovered that it takes quantity time to find quality time. If you don't carve out the time, you can't create the memory. Haven't you found that most memories you have are with the people you spend the most time with? I know that's true for me. If you want to make memories with your family, spend more time with them. If you want to create memories with your employees, you won't do it behind the door of your office. You simply can't make memories with people if you don't take time to be with them. 3. Plan for something to happen. Most people don't lead their lives, they accept their lives. They wait for memorable experiences to happen, never giving a thought to planning an experience that will make a memory. One of the most extravagant memories I ever planned was with Margaret, my wife, for our 25th wedding anniversary. We decided to share it with 30 of our closest friends. We chartered a yacht and picked up everyone in San Diego Bay. 
Once on board, we had a delectable meal and then surprised the group by having Frankie Valens entertain us with some of his trademark songs like Sixteen Candles. Our friends loved it. But the most memorable highlight of the evening was created when Margaret and I said a few words about each person and why that person held such a special place in our hearts. That night is not only a great memory for Margaret and me, but it is a great memory for the people who attended to. 4. Find a way to make something happen. What do you do when you find yourself at an event where you expect to share a memory, but nothing seems to happen? You get creative. I've been asked over and over to tell the story of the Holiday Bowl I attended in San Diego with friends about 15 years ago. The game was so dull that I ended up buying newspapers for everyone in my section so that we would have something to do. Another guy nearby, not to be outdone, bought 100 bags of peanuts and distributed them to everybody in the section. The two of us got a standing ovation, and soon the news crews were more focused on us than the game. I don't remember the score much about the game, but it's a night I'll never forget. Neither will the buddies who went with me. 5. Show that something happened. Almost anything you do today will be forgotten in just a few weeks, says John McCrone. The ability to retrieve a memory decreases exponentially unless boosted by artificial aids such as diaries and photographs. Don't you find that to be true? Do you keep pictures or souvenirs in your desk where you can see them? Do you carry photos of people you love in your wallet? Do you have a trophy, plaque, game ball, or other award on a shelf where you and others can see it? We all have things we love, not because they have any material value, but because they remind us of places we've been or things we've done. When you help someone else create a memory, give that person something to remember it by. That's great advice. Six, relive the memory. Talk about what happened. The most important part of creating a memory is reliving it. It's the payoff. Many times when I travel with others at the end of our trip, I ask them to share a favorite memory. It often leads to rich conversations. Or, I write a note to someone soon after to share my own favorite memory. It creates a connection that bonds us together and makes both of us feel great. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about trying to have quality time to make a memory if you aren't willing to invest the quantity of time it requires. Ask, what memories have I already created with people in my life that we need to relive together? Do it. Plan an experience that will commemorate an achievement or milestone that people will talk about years from now, and don't forget to create a memento of it. Remember, we shouldn't wait for memories to happen to us. We need to make memories happen. Chapter 5. Compliment People in Front of Other People John The most fundamental and straightforward way of winning with people is to give them a compliment, a sincere and meaningful word of affirmation. If you want to make others feel like a million bucks, you've got to master this elementary skill. And it's essential that you learn to give your compliments in front of others, as well as one-on-one. Why? Because that private compliment turned public instantly and dramatically increases in value. Here are reasons why that's so important. For one, people want to feel worthwhile in life. Everyone has an invisible sign hanging from his neck, says Mary Kay Ash. It says, make me feel important. Mary Kay drilled this principle into her sales team. She told them again and again, never forget this message when working with people. She knew compliments and affirmation were critical to enjoying success with others. And by the way, it's one of the reasons she was so successful. With her life savings of $5,000 and the help of her then 20-year-old son, she launched Mary Kay Cosmetics in 1963. The company now has more than 500,000 independent beauty consultants in 29 markets worldwide and Mary Kay, Inc. is ranked as one of the 100 best companies to work for in America. Mary Kay, like every other person who wins with people, knew that people want to feel worthwhile, and when you continually keep this in mind, you can't help but give compliments freely. Secondly, compliments affirm people and make them strong. To affirm is to make firm, and affirmation is a statement of truth you make firm in a person's heart when you utter it. 
As a result, it cultivates conviction. For example, when you compliment a person's attitude, you reinforce it and make it more consistent. Because you notice it in a positive way, he will be more likely to demonstrate that same attitude again. Likewise, when you affirm people's dreams, you help their dreams become more real than their doubts. Like the repetition of a weightlifting regimen, routine compliments build up people's qualities and strengthen their personalities. And thirdly, compliments in front of others are the most effective ones you can give. As commander of a $1 billion warship and a crew of 310, Mike Abrashoff used grassroots leadership to increase retention rates from 28% to 100%, reduce operating expenditures, and improve readiness. How did he do it? Among other things, he placed supreme importance on public compliments. The commanding officer of a ship is authorized to hand out 15 medals a year, he wrote. I want to err on the side of excess, so I passed out 115. Nearly every time a sailor left his ship for another assignment, Captain Abrashoff gave him or her a medal. Even if they hadn't been star players, they got medals in a public ceremony as long as they had done their best every day. I delivered a short speech describing how much we cherished the recipient's friendship, camaraderie, and hard work. Sometimes the departing sailor's shipmates told funny stories, recalling his or her foibles, trials, and triumphs. But the bottom line was that Abrashoff wanted to make them feel good by complimenting them in front of others. There is absolutely no downside to this symbolic gesture, said Abrashoff, provided it is done sincerely without hype. Captain D. Michael Abrashoff knew how to make his sailors feel like a million bucks. You can do the same thing for the people around you. Whenever you have the opportunity to publicly praise another person, don't let it slip by. Of course, you can create these opportunities, as Captain Abrashoff did, but you can also find countless opportunities if you just look for them. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about giving compliments only in private. Instead, give public praise whenever you can. Ask, who can I spotlight in front of others? Do it. Compliment someone around you in front of other people today. Remember, when you give someone a public compliment, you give him or her wings like an eagle. Chapter 6. Give Others a Reputation to Uphold Less Winston Churchill is one of John's leadership heroes. He told me once of how the Prime Minister helped to uplift millions of his countrymen in the wake of Britain's June 1940 defeat at the Battle of Dunkirk. John quoted part of the speech Churchill used to address the House of Commons upon that occasion. We shall not flag or fail. We shall fight in France. We shall fight in the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. John explained, Churchill did a lot of remarkable things during the war, but one of the greatest was his continual ability to give the English people a reputation to uphold. He inspired them, he motivated them, he challenged them, and in response, they rose to the occasion. They loved him for it. John has tried to embody this quality. He says that as he interacts with others, he constantly asks himself, what is special? unique and wonderful about this individual. Then he shares it with others. I've seen John do this time after time. John thinks the best of people and speaks about the fine qualities he sees in them. John, one of the best ways to inspire others and make them feel good about themselves is to show them who they could be. Years ago, a manager for the New York Yankees wanted rookie players to know what a privilege it was to play for the team. He used to tell them, boys, it's an honor just to put on the New York pinstripes. So when you put them on, play like world champions, play like Yankees, play proud. When you give someone a reputation to uphold, you give him something good to shoot for. It's putting something that was beyond his reach within his grasp. By speaking to their potential, you help people around you to play proud as the Yankees do. 
Why is that important? Because people will go farther than they thought they could go when someone they respect tells them they can. If you desire to give others a reputation to uphold, here are suggestions on how to get started. First, have a high opinion of people. The opinions you have of people in your life affect them profoundly. Dr. J. Sterling Livingston, formerly of the Harvard Business School and founder of the Sterling Institute Management Consulting Firm, observed, People perform consistently as they perceive you expect them to perform. A reputation is something that many people spend their entire lives trying to live down or live up to. So why not help others up instead of pushing them down? All people possess both value and potential. You can find those things if you try. Second, back up your high opinions of others with action. When you back up your beliefs in people with action, their self-doubt begins to evaporate. It's one thing to tell your teenager that you believe he's a good driver. It's another to let him have the keys to your car for the evening. Likewise, if you want a new manager to rise to the high opinion you've expressed about her, then give her significant responsibility. Nothing gives people confidence like seeing someone they respect put his money where his mouth is. Not only does it empower them emotionally, but it also resources their drive towards success. Third, look past their pasts and give them reputations for their futures. Old negative names, labels, or nicknames can block a person's growth and progress. Perhaps that's why the rites of passage in many cultures include giving a new title or name to the person being honored. A new name gives someone a hope for a new future. A fun example of this can be found in the movie and play The Man of La Mancha based on Cervantes' classic work Don Quixote. The protagonist, Don Alonso, pursues a life of chivalry and seeks to become a knight-errant long after that age of history has passed. He sees giants where others see windmills and quests where others see rabbit trails. Comically, he rescues a common prostitute named Aldanza, whom he sees as a beautiful lady. He calls her Dulcinea and makes her the object of his knightly exploits. At first, she resents him. She thinks he is mocking her because she hates herself and her life. But with time, his vision of her replaces her own and gives her hope. And as the old man lies on his deathbed, she thanks him for seeing in her what she could not see in herself. Of course, the most dramatic examples of someone overlooking the pasts of others and giving them reputations for their future can be found in the Bible. In the book of Genesis, God changes the life of Abram, an old man with no offspring, when he renames him Abraham, which means father of many. Abraham did indeed go on to become a father in his old age. And God takes Jacob, a trickster who cheats his brother, lies to his father, and constantly schemes to get ahead, and he renames him Israel, his future becoming the inception of the nation Israel. And four, give people a new name or nickname that speaks to their potential. Harry Hopman, one of the finest tennis captains and coaches in Australia's history and a member of the International Tennis Hall of Fame, at one time built the Australian team to the point that it dominated the tennis world. How did he do it? By emphasizing what he called coaching by affirmation. For example, he had a slow player whom he nicknamed Rocket. Another player who was not known for his strength or constitution he called Muscles. And it certainly gave them a boost. Rocket Rod Laver and Ken Muscles Rosewall became champions in the tennis world. Everyone enjoys the encouragement that comes from someone seeing and speaking to their potential. To apply John's teaching to your own life, forget about a person's failures in the past and focus on his or her potential in the future. Ask, what is special, unique, and wonderful about this person? How can I show it to others? Do it. Back up your high opinion of a person with action that reinforces that opinion. Remember, many people go farther than they thought they could go because someone else believed they could and told them so. Chapter 7. Say the Right Words at the Right Time. Less. 
Ask nearly anyone who knows John well, and he will tell you a story of a specific time when John said the right words to him at the right time. One of the most touching I heard while working on this book came from Dan Ryland, John's close friend and former right-hand man. John has done this so often in my life, explained Dan, but the time that stands out above all the others is when my mother died. Her death was sudden and unexpected. Dan promptly got word to John, who was out of town at the time. John and Margaret quickly changed their plans and flew back home to San Diego. Dan recalled, John and Margaret came in the door of our house in Rancho San Diego, walked right up to me, gave me a big hug, and said, I love you. That was it. There's nothing anyone could have done that would have been better. People who have not been around John up close and personal are sometimes surprised to find out how good he is at saying the right words at the right time. They're used to his public persona as a speaker, where he also excels at communication and timing. But what they may not realize is that John is a genuine encourager who loves to help people and who really understands them both on and off stage. The right words at the right time are like a soothing breeze of encouragement. John Most people recognize that words have incredible power, but saying the right words is not enough. Timing is crucial. Sometimes the best thing we can do for someone else is to hold our tongue. When tempted to give advice that's not wanted, to show off, to say, I told you so, or to point out another's error, the best policy is to say nothing. As 19th century British journalist George Sala advised, we should strive not only to say the right thing in the right place, but far more difficult to leave unsaid the wrong thing at the tempting moment. When is it time to speak up? How can you best encourage others using the right words at the right time? Keep these thoughts in mind. First, be sensitive to time and place. It's said that during one of the last major offenses of World War II, General Dwight Eisenhower was walking near the Rhine and came upon a G.I. who seemed depressed. How are you feeling, son? he asked. General, the young man replied, I'm awful nervous. Well, Eisenhower said, you and I are a good pair then because I'm nervous too. Maybe if we just walk along together, we'll be good for each other. The first key to saying the right thing at the right time is paying attention to the context. That is one of the secrets of successful communication to a large audience, and it is just as important when talking with someone one-on-one. King Solomon of ancient Israel was speaking to this truth when he wrote, Like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. If you can learn to be sensitive to your setting, you've won half the battle in saying the right words at the right time. Secondly, say it from the heart. It's not just what you say and when you say it, it's also how you say it. A Peanuts comic strip shows Lucy saying to pianist Schroeder, Do you think I'm the most beautiful girl in the world? Naturally, she has to ask several times in different ways until Schroeder, to be finally rid of her, says, Yes. Lucy mopes disconsolately and comments, even when he says it, he doesn't say it. People can tell the difference between hollow words and something that is said from the heart. Saying the right words at the right time can do more than just make a person feel good in the moment. It can have an impact that is positive and lasting. Painter Benjamin West said that he loved to paint as a youngster. When his mother left the house, he would get out the oils and try to paint. One day when he pulled out paints, brushes, paper, and various other implements, he made quite a mess. When he realized his mother would be home soon, he tried desperately to get everything cleaned up, but he didn't make it. When she walked into the room, he expected the worst. West said that what she did next completely surprised him. She picked up his painting, looked at it, and said, My, what a beautiful painting of your sister. She gave him a kiss on the cheek and walked away. With that kiss, West said, he became a painter. I don't know what kind of experience you had growing up. Perhaps, like me, you had parents who understood the power of encouragement. If not, what would you have given to have someone speak into your life at the right time, a parent, teacher, coach, or pastor? Whether or not you received it then, you can give it now. Look for opportunities to uplift others with your words. It just might change their lives.
To apply this teaching in your own life, forget about what you want to say and focus on what the other person needs to hear. Ask, what would I want to hear if I was in this person's shoes? Do it. Change someone's day or maybe even his entire life by saying the right words at the right time from the heart. Remember, like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in the right circumstances. Chapter 8. Encourage the Dreams of Others John I consider it a great privilege when people share their dreams with me. It shows me a great deal of courage and trust. And at that moment, I'm conscious that I have great power in their lives. That's no small matter. A wrong word can crush a person's dream. The right word can inspire him or her to pursue it. If someone thinks enough of you to tell you about his or her dreams, take care. Actress Candace Bergen commented, Dreams are, by definition, cursed with short lifespans. I suspect she said that because there are people who don't like to see others pursuing their dreams. It reminds them of how far they are from living their own dreams. As a result, they try to knock down anyone who is shooting for the stars. By talking others out of their dreams, critical people excuse themselves for staying in their comfort zones. Never allow yourself to become a dream killer. Instead, become a dream releaser. Even if you think another person's dream is far-fetched, that's no excuse for criticizing them. Have you given up on one of your dreams? Have you buried a hope that once looked bright and gave you energy? If so, what did it do to you? Norman Cousins, former editor of the Saturday Review and adjunct professor of psychiatry at UCLA, believed, Death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is what dies inside of us while we live. Because dreams are at the center of our souls, we must do everything in our power to help turn dreams into reality. That is one of the greatest gifts we can ever give. How can you do it? Follow these six steps. 1. Ask them to share their dream with you. Everyone has a dream, but few people are asked about it. 2. Affirm the person as well as the dream. Let the person know that you not only value his or her dream, but that you also recognize traits in that individual that can help him or her achieve it. 3. Ask about the challenges they must overcome to reach their dream. Few people ask others about their dreams. Even fewer try to find out what kinds of hurdles the person is up against to pursue them. 4. Offer your assistance. No one achieves a worthwhile dream alone. You will be amazed by how people light up when you offer to help them achieve their dream. 5. Revisit their dream with them on a consistent basis. If you really want to help others with their dreams, don't make it a one-time activity you mark off your list. Check in with them to see how they're doing and to lend assistance. 6. Determine daily to be a dream booster, not a